Just a few uh, administrative notes to start with. Uh, if you have a follow-up question uh, about today's message, you can text it at any time to the church cell phone. The number for that is on the back of your leaflet. And hopefully later I will uh, have a little time in the service to answer one or two of those. On your chairs today are some green half slips or at your tables that are take-home uh, exercises or questions for you to work through this week to help you personalize further what we talk about today. In that handout, there are some uh, packets mentioned, and you will find those on the table at the back of the worship area. Also, let me say, I may be sitting a little more today because I'm under the weather. So if I seem like I'm at a low ebb, I am. Um, we are in the third week of four in this shared teaching series with our sister church, The Branch in Alger Heights. And it is about an essential Christian belief called the Incarnation. Now, I want to highlight the fact that it is essential, meaning a lot of the stuff in the summertime when we do our Q&A series and we talk about all different kinds of questions that you guys conjure up, and Lord knows you guys come up with great questions, uh, a lot of times those are non-essential or debatable questions where different Christians who believe in the Bible equally and are equally sincere spiritually can come to different conclusions. And that's actually part of why we do it, because we want to demonstrate that. Um, this, what we're talking about in this series, is actually an essential belief of Christianity. To be a Christian, among other things, means that you believe in incarnation. That's a Latin word that means you believe that God came in the flesh, in meat. That he came to earth as a human being. But there's something very distinct about incarnation for the Christian person. I used this quote in the opening week of the series two weeks ago. You believe in the incarnation of Jesus. You believe that 2,000 years ago, God himself came to live on earth as the person of Jesus of Nazareth. And we're using two passages in your New Testament, John chapter 1, verse 14, and Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 11, to talk about that in this series. But see, as a Christian person, you don't just believe in incarnation. You believe in the model of incarnation. That is, what God did in Jesus, Jesus then asks his followers to do likewise. And one of the principal verses in the Gospel of John for that is the one up on the screen, John 20:21. 20, that as at the first part of the verse means for you to compare. So the way that Jesus was sent into the world is exactly the same way that he sends his followers or Christians into the world too. Which means that over the course of the first two weeks, Pastor Chris of the Branch and I have defined incarnation as two words. We believe that incarnation is presence. Jesus came and pitched his tent among us. He came to linger with us. And as such... He is calling Christian people to do the same with those around them. Last week, you heard Pastor Chris of the Branch talk about limitation from Philippians chapter 2. You believe that somehow, mysteriously, the God of all things came to earth as a human being, and when he did so, he took on extraordinary limits upon himself. And for those of us who want to live according to the pattern or example we see in Jesus' life, we have to live within our limits too. You cannot be everything, you cannot be everywhere, you cannot know everything, you cannot meet every need. If you missed last week, you can go online and listen to Pastor Chris explore the idea of incarnation being limitation. This week we want to return to the verse that I am tasked with in this series, which is John chapter 1, verse 14 one of the signature verses from the opening paragraph of the Gospel of John, which is the first 18 verses of that Gospel. John there very famously says that the Word, by which he means Jesus, God's timeless message and creative power, the Word, which is a term that only John uses about Jesus, no one else in the Bible does, the Word became flesh and dwelt or pitched his tent among us. That's what we talked about the first week. Well, now we're going to continue in the verse. 
the Word, or Jesus, became flesh and pitched his tent among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only Son of God, full of grace and truth. Jesus came, God's eternal Son, his creative power and timeless message, to pitch a tent among us, which is in itself a very powerful image. As I mentioned the first week, there are other gods in the ancient Near Eastern world or the Roman Empire that other people would say came to walk on earth and be among human beings. But the difference, the distinction of the Christian belief is how long Jesus stayed. He pitched his tent. He set up shop with us. He made his dwelling with us. He lingered with us. He was present with us. Ah, but see, if you were a, one of the original readers of this particular verse in John chapter 1, and you had any familiarity with the Old Testament at all, this is not where it stops for you. Because John mentions glory next. Here's the thing. That word tent in chapter 1 verse 14, in the Old Testament is used about a specific tent, a singular tent, one tent. And it is, forgive the Sunday school picture straight from flannel graph. Anybody remember flannel graph? It's the only one I could find on Google that was any good. Um, it's the tabernacle of the Old Testament. Now, for those who may not be all that biblically literate, let me help you out. Uh, in the book of Exodus, second book of your Bible, when God rescued Israel from Egypt, he dwelt with them. He didn't just say he was going to do it. He gave them a physical symbol or reminder that he was with them. And it was this movable temple that was a tent called the tabernacle. And at night, there was fire over the tabernacle to remind people. And during the day, there was smoke to remind people that God was with them them and it was overwhelming to behold and it was mysterious to behold and it was powerful to behold and it is the precursor to the Old Testament temple in Jerusalem and any reader or hearer of John chapter 1 verse 14 makes that connection oh Jesus came to tent among us he came to be God's temple or tabernacle among us what's true of a tabernacle or a temple, especially the one in the Old Testament. It was the place, if you were an Old Testament Jew, a believer in Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament, that you believe God dwelt. He may have been everywhere in the world, but he was in a very distinctive, powerful way there at his tabernacle and his temple. His glory was there. Glory is Old Testament shorthand for his power and his presence. It was there in a building. It was there first among Israel rescued from Egypt in a tent. And John says that tent is now Jesus. Um, let me ask you a question for those of you who believe in God, um, who have a spiritual life. When have you experienced God's glory? Forgive the churchy word. I just defined it for you, but I get it. Glory is kind of a churchy word. When have you experienced divine glory? I have a very vivid memory. Um, I used this story about five years ago, so no one's going to remember it, um, including myself, uh, until late this week. Um, right after we got married, our first church was in Tucson, Arizona. And my wife and I got some time off, and... Uh, we were able to uh, do a little sightseeing in the state of Arizona, which is, if you've ever been there, just beautiful to behold. All kinds of great things to see. So she had never, being a Texan, and you know how Texans are, they never, any, side, any place outside of Texas is another country, so she'd never been outside of Texas. Um, go ahead, nod your head, Heather. I am telling the truth. Uh, so we went to the, Go the Grand Canyon because she'd never been there. And if you approach the south rim of the Grand Canyon on the one major highway, state highway that leads there, 
after you enter the park, it'll bend to the left, and all of a sudden, kind of out of nowhere, the Grand Canyon will appear to your right. And she drove off the road. She was completely, utterly flabbergasted. Okay, let me go ahead and add, my wife is an awesome driver. Right? Said the legally blind guy, how hard, how hard is that to be a better driver than your legally blind husband? But she drove off the road. She, her hand shook, and she turned the wheel to the right, and we ended up in a sage bush because it was so overwhelming. And if you've ever seen it, you know that experience. What has done that for you? Maybe a sunset has done that to you, and you didn't expect it. It kind of snuck up on you. Maybe the birth of one of your children did that. Uh, if I had to pick, there was definitely one of my children that did that more than the other. Yes, I'm being funny. Not really, apparently. <laughs> you guys can guess which one of my kids I mean. Uh, what did that for you? Uh, as the movie Wild says, put yourself in the way of beauty as often as you can. When was it that you experienced glory? Maybe it was an act of love, kindness from a daughter or a son or a wife or a husband or a friend kind of out of the blue who spoke what you needed to hear or who showed you compassion when you didn't deserve it. Um, yeah, okay, that's God's glory. And what John is saying is that now, with the coming of Jesus, you take all those things I mentioned, the glory of the Grand Canyon, the birth of my kids, acts of love and compassion, kindness and grace to one another, and you roll all of that together that has ever been experienced in the human race. And there was more divine glory in the person of this lone Palestinian rabbi, this Jewish rabbi Jesus, than there wasn't all that taken together. He was the place where you came to hear and experience God's glory, like the temple of old. And the verse, by the way, tells you how that would have happened, or what was most noteworthy about Jesus, and how you would have felt God's glory in him and through him and with him. And it's the last phrase of the verse. Jesus came to dwell among us, to pitch his tent among us, to become God's tabernacle among us, and it was full of God's glory. How do we know that? It was full of grace and truth. These are not opposite terms. Sometimes we think of these two things as opposite term, terms. They're not. They're complementary term, terms. Grace. What is grace? It is completely unmerited favor and kindness. By God to us, by you to someone else, by someone else to you. It's mercy. That is a good synonym. You do not deserve it in any way, shape, or form, but it's given anyway. In your New Testament, in the language of the New Testament, there is another word that is actually the very same word in English we call grace, and it's this. The word gift is also the word grace. Jesus was full of grace. In fact, verse 16 of the prologue, chapter 1 of the Gospel of John says, beautiful image. From Jesus' fullness, we have received grace upon grace. It's as if Jesus is a cup and God is filling him with grace to the brim. And it does, God does not stop when the water comes close to the brim of the cup. He just keeps pouring. And that grace spills over the sides. From his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. How do you see that in the life of Jesus? Here's how it unfolds in the Gospel of John. Two chapters later in John chapter 3, a religious leader named Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night because he's scared that by asking questions of Jesus, being truly and authentically inquisitive about Jesus, uh, he may lose his role, he may lose his life, uh, he certainly will lose almost everything that he has. And so he comes to Jesus and he asks questions. And Jesus graces him with answers receives him compassionately, doesn't run him down for not being supportive unto now. No, he receives Nick at night and loves him. The next chapter, Jesus travels to Samaria and encounters in John chapter 4 a woman at a well, a woman who has been married a lot of times, way more than any of you, way more than many of us put together. 
And she's given up on the concept of marriage and now is just shacked up with somebody. In her culture, she is the most marginalized person you might meet, other than a leper, perhaps. And there, Jesus graces her. He says, I'm not going to avoid you. I'm not going to tell you to go away so I can drink my water from the well. No, engage me. Ask me your questions. Let me change your life through a singular conversation. Jesus has a similar encounter at the end of John chapter 7 and the beginning of John chapter 8 when a woman is caught in the act of adultery itself and is brought before the religious leaders to be stoned for it. And Jesus, only Jesus, intervenes to save her life. He didn't have to do it, but he's a gracious man, full of grace upon grace. Of course he had to intervene and stop that unrighteousness. A couple of chapters later in John chapter 9, a blind man approaches Jesus, been blind his whole life, and says, can you heal me, Jesus? And Jesus does. Graces him with the gift of physical healing. And then says to him, by the way, you thought you had it bad? Spiritually blind people? Way worse. But I'm willing to grace them too. This is how you watch Jesus, full of grace upon grace, unfold how he will display God's glory to us throughout his life. He is also full of truth. It is in Jesus' voice that you encounter what feels like, what seems like to you, what fills your brain and your heart and tells you this is divine. This is timeless. There's a reason why we still cling to this man's words as much today in the year 2015 as they did 2,000 years ago. Because it will never grow old. It is from the lips of God himself. And here's the thing. All of you, oh, I should have switched slides like five minutes ago. Sorry about that. Here's the thing. Whether or not you know it, I hope that you do. That's why you are interested in Jesus too. That's why you're here. That's why you're committed to Jesus. It's not because your family was. It's not because it's the right thing to do in this particular culture in West Michigan. It's not because you have friends here. You are committed to Jesus because you have encountered God's glory in him, and it is full of grace and truth. And there is no other voice in your life like his. There is no one so kind and no one so just at the same time. If you haven't experienced that in Jesus, I implore you to realize that the more you get to know him, the more you rub shoulders with him, the more you talk to his people who know him and love him, that should be the result. I, uh, one of the questions that I and the steering team have been wrestling with for six months almost now is this particular question, a great one for churches to ask. What can people encounter or in experience here in the community of faith called church, in this case called River Tree? that they can't encounter or experience anywhere else in their life. In their wired life. In their connection to the internet that overflows with information. In their workplace, among their friends and family. What is distinct about God's people here? Let me suggest to you that one of the best answers to that is what we've talked about so far. What they can experience is Jesus in whom you find God's glory, full of grace and truth. I have good news for you. Uh, if you have grown up uh, and you have not been told about God or Jesus in a way that sounds like he is gloriously gracious and truthful, you weren't told about Jesus. You were told about somebody else. Somebody's fabrication of Jesus somebody's caricature of Jesus. Because the real Jesus, according to the Gospel of John, is full of grace and truth. And he is as captivating to your imagination and heart as the Grand Canyon was to my wife some 17 years ago. This is what you offer people. This is what is offered to you here. Now so far, we've talked about Jesus. God's new tabernacle among us, his temple, in whom, if nowhere else, you can find God's presence and power, his glory, his grace, and his truth. However, 
Jesus does not leave it there. This is very late in Jesus' life, in the same gospel. So you know that there's a connection between what Jesus says here and what was said in John chapter 1. This is the last night of Jesus' life before he heads out to the Garden of Gethsemane to be murdered on a Roman cross. And the very last act of his life before his trial and execution is to pray. We call it his high priestly prayer, and it comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 17. Part of what he does in that prayer is he prays for his followers. He prays for you, and he prays for me, and everybody else who has claimed the name of Jesus and committed their life to him. And please notice part of what he prays. Something you might just blow right by if we hadn't done the 15 minutes of work to talk about glory. He prays for his followers, I have given them, that is my followers, the glory that you, Father, gave me. So that they may be one, as you and I, Father, are one. I and them and you and me. So that they may be brought to complete unity together. And then when that happens, the world will know that you sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. There's a lot to talk about in that verse. We're actually only going to talk about the first phrase. I now give to them, my followers, the glory that you, Father, have given me. Well, now you can intelligently describe what Jesus' glory was like. Because we talked about it. And Jesus says, remarkably, he doesn't want to keep it for himself. He wants to pass it on to his followers. And somehow, you and I as his disciples bear God's glory in the same way that he himself did so long ago. Now, the Apostle Paul, who writes most of your New Testament, uses the same idea with this phrase. He calls believers, you and I, Christian people, individually and together gathered as a church, God's new temple. Same idea. God's glory dwells in you. The great American poet Maya Angelou says that every person you encounter contains, here's the quote, trails of the wisps of divine glory. Do you understand yourself that way? Do you see other people that way? Let's start with you. Um, so often... Human beings tend to just a very a couple of common things that define their self-talk about themselves, whether it only happens in their brain or if it happens to other people. Um, they will define themselves by their successes. Um, if it's a man in American culture, that tends to be your work success. And how much you make or how much you've advanced in your particular company or what degree you're pursuing to do better. This is how you define your success. Um, still in our culture, oftentimes, we haven't gotten that much far past this yet, um, for a woman, if she's a mom, she will define herself by her kids and her marriage. And this is what she talks about. Uh, this is how she thinks about whether or not she is successful. Hmm. Here's another thing that human beings tend to talk about a lot or think a lot about themselves. They think about their worries and their stresses or their anxieties a lot. You know people like this because when you hear them, they talk about what's wrong in their life or what they can't fix in their life. Okay? This is very close to a third kind of person who just runs themselves down all the time. And what they do is find what's wrong with themselves. And they'll be glad to tell you about it. Or sometimes for these people, they're very quiet about it and it only lives in here. Here's the problem with all three of those very common ways that American humans define themselves. According to Jesus, it's incorrect. Or, better said, it's off-center. Let me tell you who you are. According to Jesus, not according to me. If you are a follower of Jesus, you bear his glory. He wants to give it to you. So that there are those wisps of glory about you to other people. 
when other people encounter you and listen to you, it is as if they are at a temple. And they sense that there is something more to you, bigger than you, inside of you, than just yourself. You have a connection to the God of all life and all light. And you are committed to radiating that to other people. Do you know that about yourself? What's glorious about you? Defined according to Jesus, if he is the poster child for God's glory, what is glorious about you? Because if Jesus is right in John 17, it's there. What is it? Are you kind-hearted and merciful? That is not just a personality trait. That is divine glory radiating to the world around you. Are you wise? Are you a servant? Do you encourage others with your words? Are you generous? Yeah, that's divine glory showing up in you. You ought to spend some time this week. Because Jesus would tell you to. Not because you want to pat yourself on the back, but because you want to take him at his word. There is something glorious about you. Ask a good friend to tell you what's glorious about you. How do they experience God through you and in you? Because it's there. And we have to flip this, though. Is that how you look at other people? Is that how you look at the people here? I get it. Sometimes they don't say what you wish they would say. Sometimes they don't show up for things that you wish they would show up for. Sometimes they're not enough like you. Sometimes they have very visible character flaws. I get all that. If they're a disciple of Jesus, they're glorious. Is that how you look at other people? Do you have eyes? Do you have a heart that can see God's glory in others? One of the things I suggest to you on that half sheet this week is you should spend some time telling the people around you in your life already how you see God's presence and power, his glory in them. And then you need to have the spiritual discipline to wake up and remind yourself, yeah, I've lived with my wife 30 years now, and she is still glorious. In fact, the longer I'm with her, the more I believe it. Even though I get it, she makes mistakes. There are probably things about herself she's never going to be able to change. That's okay. She's glorious. Can you say that to your kids? Your kids who are just starting their faith journey, can you say to them, hey, let me tell you how I see God in you. I'm not just going to tell you where you're good. I'm not just going to tell you where you're strong. I'm going to tell you where God shows up in your life. There is an investment you as a parent can make that they will never, ever grow weary of. And on down the line, the people here, your friends, other Christians you know in your workplace, do you have the eyes to see Jesus' glory in them? Because it's there. Imagine how remarkable it would be if a group of people like us, committed to the way of Jesus, said, Whatever else we do, we are going to see God's glory in other people. Imagine. And by the way, just like was true in Jesus, I can tell you the most glorious thing about his followers. When they choose to display, display God's glory. You want to know how you can do that most to the people around you? Be gracious and be truthful. Because that's what was most glorious about him. Jesus came and tented among us as God's new temple, full of God's glory, full of grace and truth, we are told. When Jesus says in John 17, now I'm going to pass along or share or give that divine glory to you, you better believe what he means most of all is now I put on you the task, but also the great gift of being gracious to people being truthful to people you realize right there are people in your life 
who have not been treated graciously in years, not just months, years. Every relationship they have at home or with their friends or elsewhere is based on merit. They are treated according to what they do, how they succeed, or in some cases, unfortunately, how they've failed. And we, being the people of Jesus, say, we don't believe that's glorious. What's most glorious is we don't care who you are and how bad you're messed up, like the woman at the well in John 4, like the woman caught in adultery in John 7 and 8. Come here, and you will receive glorious grace from me, from us. This is who we aspire to be. You want to radiate God's presence and power to others? Choose the difficult path of being merciful and compassionate to people who don't deserve it. Because in the end, none of us do. If you're going to play the game of only behaving toward people or speaking to people according to what they deserve, you will lose out too. Because others might treat you the same way. Be truthful. When people approach you and they ask your advice, when something comes up spontaneously in conversation and you feel that prompt of God's Spirit inside to say something to them, here's the deal. They don't want your opinion. Now they may ask for it and those may even be the words they use. That is not what they need from you. And it is not the greatest thing that you have to give. As a follower of Jesus, you have something far better. You have truth to offer. Which is not your opinion, I'm sorry to inform you. It is Jesus' opinion. It is Jesus' perspective. So when somebody comes to you as they come to me as a pastor and they ask, how do I fix this in my life? I have this decision to make and I don't know what to do. I have this kid and I'm not sure how to parent him or her. Of course you can tap into your accumulated experience and wisdom of living. Great! I'm sure you're a far wiser person than I am. But here's the thing, that's not what they need. They need from you the words of Jesus. They need from you the truth of Jesus. Because unlike your words and mine, those will last. They will last decades in that person's life. They will last long after you and I are dead. You are people who bear truth. You are witnesses, to use a phrase from the Gospel of John, you are witnesses to the truth. You have heard it and experienced it yourself in the person of Jesus. Now, be glorious. And take the little bit, even if it's only a little bit, Take a little bit that you know about Jesus and pass that on to the others who seek you out or who talk to you. You realize, right, this is one of the reasons why we as a church for, for between two and a half and four months every year talk about the Gospels in your New Testament. You read through a Gospel in your New Testament because I want you so saturated with the person of Jesus that you can begin to do what I just described that you know what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, that you know what he said about forgiveness, that you understand the parable of the prodigal son and how radical that perspective is. And when you hear a situation that comes to you at just the right moment, you know what truth to tap into and to give that person. You as followers of Jesus, among all people, can offer this, this glory, to others. Today we have talked about incarnation. Incarnation is glorious. It is God's presence and power among us as a tent to stay with us as God's new temple. And among all other things, the thing that makes it most glorious is it is full of grace and truth. And as Jesus, as those things were true of Jesus, now he says to you, his followers, 2,000 years later, as the Father sent me into the world to be this, now I send you 
to be this for the world. This is a very famous quote from one of the most influential Christians of the last hundred years in our country. Martin Luther King Jr. Spoken in the fury of the civil rights movement in the 1960s. This is a quote you may know from high school history textbooks. Uh, let me suggest to you we can look at this and appreciate it and take it to heart in such a new light based on what we've talked about today. Martin Luther King said in the midst of that fight to set the marginalized and the oppressed free in this country, I have a dream that one day every valley, valley will be exalted, every hill and mountain will be made low. The rough places will be made straight and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh will see it together. According to Jesus, the place where all flesh will see it most is in him and in you, his followers. And if that breaks down, then all is lost. No sunset, no birth of a child, no Grand Canyon can be as glorious as the grace and truth of Jesus or your commitment to being the same. Let me give you a minute here at the end of the message to just pause and let God reinforce for you what it is that he has spoken to you today. And in just a few moments, I will pray for us all.